Welcome to our mini service this morning. As we gather today, let us focus on the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Let us glorify his name. Lord Jesus, you declared yourself the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. We give thanks this morning that through your death on the cross, if we proclaim you Lord of our lives, then our salvation is assured. You have promised that you will lose none of those whom your heavenly Father has given to you. Thank you that in uncertain times we can wholly depend upon your, you, our Saviour and our Lord. Amen. We thank you that you are an amazing God and we thank you, Lord, that nothing phases you. Even these strange times we find ourselves in right now. Thank you, Lord, you are everlasting. You don't change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we praise your mighty name. That's the Lord.
Our Bible reading this week is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. A few months ago, we received an email here at church from a lady called Sandy. Sandy lived in Seaford and she wanted to connect with a Baptist church because her mum and dad had been Baptists. She believed in God, but in a busy working life as a carer, she hadn't had the time to regularly attend the church. The reason she got in contact was because she was terminally ill with cancer. So Hilary, our pastoral worker, visited her and met her a number of times. They shared in reading the Bible and prayed together. And I also met with her and talked about her funeral plans. Four weeks ago, I received a text from Sandy. She was in hospital and wanted to see me. She was very ill and receiving end-of-life care. I wasn't sure if I would be allowed to visit her, but I went anyway. The ward was closed, but a nurse let me in and I spent an hour with her. She said later that seeing me had been really important on that day. As we talked, she asked me a question. She said, I've never been baptised, Andy. Would it be possible to baptise me before I die? I promised that if at all possible, I would be happy to do this on profession of her faith in Jesus as her Lord and Saviour. We weren't sure whether Sandy would be able to leave hospital, but Sandy was a very determined lady who said she wanted to die at home. And so she did leave hospital. And I went to see her again that Friday and left her with a little order of service for a baptism. We arranged that to happen the following Tuesday. Her sister Sue was able to be present to be a witness. On that Tuesday morning, I received a text from Sue to say that Sandy hadn't had a very good night, but she still wanted to go ahead with the baptism. So I went round, put my gloves on, and arranged the baptism by pouring water over Sandy's head. She made the promises that we would ask every candidate to make. Did she confess Jesus as her Lord and Saviour? And she answered, I do. Do you turn from sin, renounce evil, and intend to follow Christ? She replied, I do. I then baptised her with water. And after we'd prayed together, she said, I feel a real sense of peace now. Later that week, Sandy's health deteriorated massively. And on Easter Sunday, I received a text from Sue to say that Sandy had peacefully passed away a few minutes before. I've asked permission from Sue and her brother Robert to share this true story of a lady who has been through great suffering but has now been, as the Salvation Army so wonderfully put it, promoted to glory. And I've told the story 
to show that our personal salvation is vitally important. Peter, the writer of our letter, knew this only too well. He'd been Jesus' trusted right-hand man. And although he'd fully committed his life to following Jesus, after Jesus was arrested, Peter denied that he knew Jesus. And when Jesus dies on the cross, Peter is not there. Has he lost his salvation through denying Jesus? Peter is given another opportunity because Jesus is raised to life again and he meets his disciples by the lakeside and shares breakfast with them. And then he and Peter draw to one side. Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And each time Peter replies, you know that I love you, Lord. In asking him three times, Jesus cancels out the three denials that Peter made the night before the crucifixion. Peter's salvation is secure. When he writes to the scattered Christian believers who are suffering for their faith, he is very clear that despite their suffering, the salvation of their souls is secure. As John said last week, despite all we may be going through at the moment, we can rely on God's promise that he will always be with us. Peter here points us back to the prophets in the Old Testament who experienced great trials in their own lives. One of those was Jeremiah, who was exiled, who experienced great sadness and suffering in his own life. Indeed, he's sometimes called the weeping prophet. But despite that, he was able to look forward with hope. Listen to these words from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Jeremiah looks forward to a time in the future when God will make a new covenant with his people. And that new covenant has been fulfilled through the coming of Jesus Christ, the longed for Messiah who has, who has ushered in his new kingdom, who has dealt with the problem of mankind's sinfulness by sacrificing his own life on a cross, but who has gloriously risen to life again. Jeremiah was looking forward to this day. But Peter has seen this happen with his own eyes. He has spoken about this at the Feast of Pentecost at the Jerusalem Temple. And over 3,000 respond, asking for forgiveness and being baptised. Amongst them, men and women from Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. The same men and women hearing this letter read to them now. So what has convinced them to put their faith in Jesus Christ? It is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who inspired Jeremiah to prophesy about a future salvation. There is a full continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. God's Holy Spirit enables the prophets of the Old Testament to look forward 
to the day when God's kingdom will be restored on earth. God's Holy Spirit is present in power when Jesus comes and heals the sick, drives out evil spirits and raises the dead to life. God's Holy Spirit enables the leaders of the early church, like Peter, to speak with boldness and power to those listening, immediately respond to his appeal. God's Holy Spirit is present and active today in the hearts and minds of people across our world. That is why we are seeing new Christians in China, in Iran, in other countries across our world. And I believe we are seeing the Holy Spirit working in this country, despite the efforts of those who would wish to deny the power of God. I was sad to see how little coverage there was over the Easter weekend about why the weekend is a holiday. The Queen recorded a wonderful Easter message and talked about her own Christian faith and the importance of Jesus' resurrection. But what did the news report? The BBC News Bulletin simply reported that she said that we would overcome the coronavirus. No mention of Jesus. No mention of the resurrection. They'd sanitised out the Christian part of her message. But our God is more powerful than that. Our God's kingdom is a kingdom of people's hearts. And one by one and family by family, the kingdom grows. And what are we called to do as Christian believers in our current circumstances? Well, Peter puts it like this. Prepare your minds for action. Our responsibility is to be ready to give an account of why we are prepared to put our faith in the risen Lord Jesus and through our individual lives to be a witness to those Christian values that still underpin our society today. To share the hope that we have of new life now and eternal life. Our hope is built on Jesus Christ, on his sacrifice on the cross, on his blood shed so that we may be made right with God. Through his suffering, Jesus is glorified. And although we may suffer too, as Sandy did, we too can take hold of our salvation, secure in the knowledge that faith in Jesus Christ will secure for us an everlasting life. And when Jesus returns, we will be part of the kingdom of God that will fill the whole earth. Let us pray together now. Spirit of the living Christ, come upon us in the glory of your risen power. Spirit of the living Christ, come upon us in all the humility of your wonderful love. Spirit of the living Christ, come upon us so that new life may course within our veins. New love bind us together with one purpose, to see the kingdom of God grow. May your Holy Spirit give us boldness to serve you with fearless passion. Amen. We pray now for the leaders of our country. We pray today for those who lead us in national government, in our civil service, in our health authorities and our local authorities. Give them wisdom as they make incredibly difficult decisions at this time, particularly as they consider when to relax the current restrictions on daily life. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to guide those decisions so that they can implement strategies and policies which will be for the good of all, but especially for those who are the weakest and most vulnerable in our society. Lord Jesus, hear 
our prayer today. Amen. And finally, a prayer for boldness. We are not people of fear. We are people of courage. We are not people who protect our own safety. We are people who protect our neighbour's safety. We are not people of greed. We are people of generosity. We are your people, God, giving and loving, wherever we are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. Amen. There is a day that all creation's waiting for. A day of freedom and liberation for the earth. And on that day, the Lord will come to meet Him. And when we see him, in an instant we'll be changed. The trumpet sounds, and the dead will then be raised. By his power, never to perish again. Once only flesh, now clothed in immortality. Death has now been swallowed up in victory.
close our service with the word of blessing that Peter wrote in his letter to the churches in modern day Turkey. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen.